Okay, everybody, uh, welcome. Um, uh, the observant ones of you will have noticed that I'm not Rasmus Nielsen from the Royce Institute. I'm his colleague, David Levy. Um, and uh, Rasmus wasn't able to be here today. He had to go to Denmark for something today. So I'm chairing this session, but welcome to this question, uh, session on critical perspectives on, the disinf on, on disinformation. And uh, we're very pleased that we have uh, three uh, panelists here with us to um, contribute to this. Alex Alexios Mansalis uh, from the Pointer Institute, where he leads the International Fact-Checking Network. Um, and he was also a member of the European high-level group, uh, high-level expert group on fake news. We have Farida, Farida Viz, who is professor of digital media at Manchester School of Art and is director of the Visual Social Media Lab there. Um, and Martin Moore here on my left, who's director of the Center for the Study of Media Communication and Power and a senior research fellow in the Policy Institute at King's College London. So what we're going to do is um, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to kind of open up for like five to seven minutes um, to give their perspective on this issue. Uh, then we may have a little bit of discussion. I may probe them with a few questions, and then we're going to talk, turn to you uh, for your critical perspectives on this issue. But we're going to start with uh, Alexios, and then go to Farida, and then go to Martin. So, uh, Alexios, over to you. Hi. How will doing? Um, I do not have a booster seat like uh, Mark Zuckerberg did, so I hope <laughs> you can see me uh, back here. Um, I, I run the International Fact-Checking Network. It's uh, an alliance of uh, fact-checking projects around the world. Um, I, I'll take the opening uh, few minutes to talk about uh, uh, what we've done with Facebook and uh, uh, the high-level group that uh, uh, was just mentioned. So in 2016, um, 20 fact-checking organizations uh, wrote an open letter to Mark Zuckerberg uh, uh, sort of suggesting that if they were serious, if Facebook was serious about uh, working to fight fake news, it should turn to sort of people who do that for a living. Um, and so in December 2016, Facebook did uh, turn to people who uh, do that for a living uh, and started a, uh, a partnership, uh, first uh, exclusive to the United States, uh, but now active in uh, seven countries, France, Germany, Netherlands, uh, Italy, Mexico and Indonesia and, uh, and growing. Um, that's, there's lots of uh, uh, positives and negatives in that uh, partnership, and maybe we can talk about them later. Um, I think that uh, we are here to talk about sort of critical perspectives, and I think there are three major issues that I'd like to raise about the narrative over where we are with the disinformation in the disinformation space. First is how we cover studies. Um, I think that Every study that comes out lately uh, on, on misinformation and fake news, usually we react, but the headlines are, oh my God, we're drowning in fake news, uh, uh, the truth is dead, uh, lol, nothing matters. Uh, and I think uh, this kind of very uh, uh, alarmist approach uh, to the situation is not actually helping us at all to, to sort of glean the lessons that these studies contain. And it conveniently ignores several positive news that come out of studies, including the fact that actually that backfire effect that we all uh, had uh, read about, that people believe something even more after they're g corrected, actually failed the replication test over and over again over the past two years. So that's one thing. The second thing that I'm concerned about, and I think is a, a bit of a, a false narrative or a problematic narrative, is that we need to regulate fast uh, uh, anything that moves. Uh, and I think anyone that uh, saw uh, enough of the hearings uh, uh, the other day uh, uh, is probably aware that the people regulating may not be, the people legislating may not be the best equipped uh, to uh, get us out of this solution, right? When you have a senator say, uh, I'm, if I'm sending emails on WhatsApp, uh, can you read it, Mr. Zuckerberg, or something along those lines, um, doesn't set a lot of hope for, for what uh, legislation could do. And closer to home, in Italy, uh, uh, the approach of the Interior Ministry to set up a, a fake news police and uh, that uh, people could report fake news to without any indication of the methodology or any indication of how this would uh, work uh, just does not seem like the, the right approach. Third and last um, uh, of the sort of critical issues for me is that uh, uh, there's a lot of schadenfreude in media coverage of Facebook. There's a lot of, ha ha, you ate our advertising pie, now suck it. Um, and I think that uh, is uh, uh, coloring some of the analysis. I don't want to absolve Facebook of any of its many uh, um, 
uh, sins, uh, but I also want to um, sort of remember that around the world, we are an international organization, around the world many fact checkers wouldn't have an audience without Facebook. It's all fun and games saying that Facebook is evil in America uh, when in countries where the press wouldn't give you access if you're a fact checker saying that the government is wrong. Uh, Facebook was the only way to get that done. And I know there are, uh, uh, even in this room, people working in difficult countries uh, where Facebook is a crucial element uh, of their strategy to reach the public with, with the truth. So these are three metrics and hopefully we'll talk about them in, in greater detail afterwards. I did want to open and end my opening with uh, uh, sort of six key takeaways um, that we, um, so the European Commission had uh, this expert group process, uh, a public consultation process, and all of it will culminate in a communication on April 25th uh, around the topic of fake news. And so with uh, uh, Rasmus, who's, who's, who's not here, Claire Wardle of First Draft News, uh, Clara jimenez Cruz of uh, Maldito Bulo, and uh, Gregoire Le Marchand of AFP, uh, we sort of had six things that we liked from uh, the report that, that was published uh, a month ago, and I'm just going to go quickly through them. One is that we should, at least institutions should, uh, abandon or clearly define the term fake news. Uh, it's, uh, it's fine to use it among practitioners. I'm not uh, an intransigent uh, pass that on about using it, uh, but I think that when it's used by governments, it usually means things I don't like to hear, and it's usually used uh, uh, to cloak authoritarian approaches to legislation, as we saw in Malaysia. Uh, I th the other thing we saw was the calls to fund innovation and education uh, in fact-checking. That's something governments could do if they're itching to do things. Um, we can and must demand greater transparency from Facebook and Google, uh, especially on the exercises that they're conducting on fighting misinformation. Um, this partnership we have with um, the fact checkers and Facebook has been going on for a year and a half and Facebook has yet to release public data of what they've learned from it. Um, this is possibly the largest experiment in combating online misinformation ever. We need to know how it's going so that we can get better at our work. Um, <coughs> But just as we should demand that Facebook share data, I think institutions should share data too, right? How many of the governments and the um, people clamoring for, for, for more transparency on Facebook uh, then publish uh, statistics very poorly or don't uh, publish them at all? And I think in this, the ONS is a great model uh, of how they work with fact checkers to make their statistics machine readable and in API form so that fact checkers can move fast and just, reliable just, information. Just to be clear, that's the UK Office for National right. Statistics. Yep. Thank you. Um, uh, and I guess final, um, I think we need to fund research. A lot of the research on misinformation is Americanocentric, and we don't know how, if that translates uh, in, in Europe. And so uh, before we uh, start regulating uh, left and right, we need to understand the size of the phenomenon and the impact of the phenomenon. What, what actually is, is happening and what actually is it achieving? Um, and so I, I think that's... Uh, uh, these could be great steps forward. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks for giving such a um, uh, quick uh, overview and covering a lot of important ground. Thank you. Uh, Farida, over to you for your introductory comments. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you for raising the point about research. So I will um, talk about research. So I run a lab called the Visual Social Media Lab, which brings together academics and um, industry researchers interested in better understanding the role of visuals in society. And one of the things that we've been focusing on in the last sort of 18 months um, is really the role of images in mis- and disinformation. Um, and I think all of us can agree in this room that if we think of some of the big mis- and disinformation stories, they're often uh, image-led. Um, and what happens is that those images tend to not be really understood. So when we talk about, you know, what is a kind of a critical perspective of what is not being discussed in this space, um, I feel that a real clear understanding of the role of visuals is not um, centrally um, discussed and not taken seriously enough. Um, and one of the things that we would argue, and this is some of the work that we've been doing with um, First Draft News, is we would argue that visuals and memes are both um, extremely complex and really hard to understand, both for researchers um, and also for journalists, but they can do an enormous amount of damage, um, specifically if you think about their role in election cycles. Um, and what is particularly important is to understand the context um, within which these images circulate. 
So last year um, at the festival, I was involved in a, a very uh, popular panel on memes and mis and disinformation, and we decided to do something similar again this year. We had another panel yesterday, um, and there was a really strong interest from journalists to do something really hands-on. So what we did this year is we had some small workshops to also think about what are the resources that we can build for journalists. So one of the things that I um, sort of said as a small provocation is, for example, what would a know your meme for journalists look like as a resource? So when you get these images, where could you go potentially to better understand their context and so on and how they're being used? So. One of the things that we ended up doing with um, First Draft News um, is a collaboration specifically around the role of images in mis- and disinformation around two European elections. And again, um, to Alexios's point, research that is, is uh, focused on what is happening in, in Europe, and so we focused on the French and the UK elections last year, um, and we um, looked at data that was produced by two projects, uh, Crosscheck in France, um, and uh, the election monitoring project in the UK, which produced essentially uh, 95 examples of misleading images in, in big kind of um, big news stories. Um, and that was our starting point. So essentially what we, what we did is we took the products of these two projects that they were using um, both for a website and for um, newsletters that they were sending out to journalists. And we took that as a starting point for a database to then analyze in much more detail what is actually going on with these images. Why are they misleading? Why are they persuasive? You know, what are the motivations and so on behind it? So what we ended up building was um, quite a um, detailed methodology, very rigorous methodology, and we subjected these 95 images to trying to understand the type of visual, um, and we came up with a typology of um, 21 different categories. Uh, the level of accuracy, so this is building out from the typology that Claire Wardle built around mis- and disinformation, but this now specifically focused on images. Um, the topic of the visual, the motivation for the visual, um, who posted it, where it was posted, and the source of the visual. So really a very detailed trying to understand what was going on. Now in terms of results, I think um, what is really relevant is to start to see differences in terms of what is happening in different European countries. So across these two elections, all together, it was five different types of visuals that made up 60% of all the visuals that were shared. Um, unsurprisingly, um, videos, photographs, but also data visualizations um, played a huge role in, in misleading stories, um, where the data visualization was really, really hard to unpack and very problematic. Um, photos with text played a big role, um, and screenshots of tweets. So those were the bulk of the visuals that were being shared. But there were key country differences. So if we look at France, 28% of these visuals were photographs versus only 10% in the UK. I don't know why that is, but I think it is quite a significant um, difference that maybe if we look at some, um, some other um, uh, statistics, in the UK, 12% of the images were photographs with text. And the text would often be, uh, the image would often be a politician with text in a kind of misleading slant on something this politician had said. But then if we look at the French data, it was only 2%, right? So there is this kind of, um, you know, maybe national preference for particular kinds of visuals. Um, why does this matter? Um, it, can, it can start to, I think, build understanding for signals of potential misleading content. So what types of images are likely to be misleading in different national contexts? Um, and of course, this is only, um, this is only a beginning. But I think they play a particular role around election cycles. And if we think about you know, the role of mis- and disinformation and the democratic process, I think um, particularly at election points, they are incredibly important to better understand. So just a, a few other um, bits of statistics that came out of that report that we'll be publishing um, in the next few weeks. If we look at the accuracy level, so this is expanding on this typology that Claire um, worked on, the biggest category was false context. So what we have here is we have images that are truthful, um, and if, if uh, you want I can um, show you an example that I can expand on in the Q&A, where the image is technically truthful, it is the context of the image that is false. 
So this was 30% of the, the, the overall data set was in this category of false context. But again, if we, if we look at the country-specific data, it was actually 42% in the French case versus 19% in the UK case. So it, it played a huge role in the French elections. So if we start to do that for a number of European countries, a number of election cycles, and we start to recognize these signals or what kinds of images are particularly um, problematic, um, we could potentially you know, help the work of, um, of people like Alexios and just to better understand what is happening Europe-wide, but of course also beyond Europe. The other thing that I think is incredibly relevant um, and tricky about this finding is how difficult this will be to combat at platform level. This is not something that you can fix algorithmically because the image itself is not something that you can track and trace and say this is a false image. It is the context. So if you think about it, um, every use of that same image can potentially produce a different context. And it's the context <coughs> that produces um, the misleading information. So when it comes to how do we address this, what are the solutions to this, um, I, I feel that this, this requires much deeper thinking, a very collaborative, long-term approach to build resources, to build data sets um, across academia, across journalism, um, with the platforms, um, to produce methodologies um, that can help us you know, identify these signals, um, and particularly to, um, to do this around, around elections. Um, so I will leave it there um, for my opening comments, but if you want to see it, one of the images that um, I think is really relevant in this space, then I will do that in the Q&A. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Rita. Um, and I think we'll come back and look at the image uh, a bit later. Martin, over to you. Thank you, David. Um, on the way here, I was uh, <coughs> listening to um, uh, uh, the uh, New York Times' daily podcast, and um, they were talking about the now infamous uh, uh, session of Mark Zuckerberg in front of the Senate on Tuesday. I think they described it as a, uh, a five-hour tech support call. Um, and uh, uh, it was, exactly as Alexa said, it was, it, it was educational, not, not just from the perspective of understanding, in a way, how little some of the senators knew ab about how Facebook worked. Um, but I think if giving an indication is, at, from my experience at least, that, that extends much more broadly um, than just the U.S. Senate. It certainly extends to a lot of policymakers in the U.K. Um, it certainly extends to some of the conversations I've had with people in other countries and with um, uh, those within government in other countries who are responsible, technically responsible, for dealing with this area. Um, and uh, like Alexios, I, I would be very anxious uh, about um, jumping in with regulation and legislation um, not least because so many of them seem to be itching to rush in with regulation and legislation. Um, uh, and in my very short intro, I'd just like to make a, a plea, really, for much greater understanding um, of how this world works, not least an understanding of some of these structures of this world, because that's what I've certainly learned over the last few years, is the degree to which many of these problems are uh, are not about um, necessarily about a single specific malicious actor or a single specific uh, malicious group, but they are about some of the ways in which, particularly these platforms, but also the web more generally, is, is structured. And the most obvious one, of course, being um, uh, ad tech. Um, I don't know who here was in um, uh, uh, Craig Silverman's presentation workshop this morning, um, but he, he described um, ad tech, which is essentially the, the, the business model on which much of news and information on the web runs as a dumpster fire. Um, and certainly I've, I've spent the last two or three months trying to properly understand um, how ad tech works. It is phenomenally complicated and it's a phenomenal mess. And yet, this is what, um, without understanding how it works, you can't understand why teenagers in Velej um, were spending more time inventing news because they could work, earn more money on ad, Google AdSense and Facebook ads um, than they could in a day job anywhere else in Velej. You can't understand you know, why it is that many news sites and many news sites more generally um, don't know that there are ads appearing on their site which are either fake news or you know, uh, uh, um, those horrible clickbait celebrity type news stories. Um, they literally don't know that they're appearing there. Even, even I think... <laughs> Uh, the pointer site um, had some ads appearing on it, which were which were fake news. So, so I think you know, uh, I think what I'd like to do is just make a, make a plea for much greater understanding, and give three, hopefully constructive ideas as to where uh, particularly academic research can be helpful 
um, in trying to move forward some of this discussion. Um, the first is um, in trying to uh, better understand the dynamics of different online communities because, because they do function very, very differently, but I don't think we really get why that is. And to give a specific example, and this is not mine, this is some fascinating research um, by one called Jessica Bayer, who was looking at how different online communities um, work together, and she compared, uh, two of the ones she compared were um, World of Warcraft and um, 4chan. I don't know who's familiar with both of those sites, but uh, uh, both attract demographically relatively similar young male communities. Um, uh, they, uh, the, the way in which um, the different individuals interact, interact on those sites is entirely different. On the one hand, in the world of Warcraft, and I can talk more at length about this afterwards, um, there's a sort of a, uh, you might call it a kind of healthy, constructive engagement. Um, uh, it's relatively civil and respectful of one another. Um, on 4chan, it is, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I think self-described as toxic. Um, uh, it, is, it is a shock bulletin site. Um, the reason why it's particularly important in this case is because um, 4chan was responsible for some of the most um, compelling and persuasive propaganda that was spread during the US 2016 election campaign of any group, um, much of it uh, uh, seeded out through Reddit and other sites and through Facebook. Um, and understanding why it was that it did that and why, what, what the dynamics of that site were and why they enabled that, I think is crucial to figuring out how we respond to it. Um, the second is, um, uh, better understanding what political campaigns are actually, and political activists are actually sending out, particularly during election campaigns. So there was a, uh, 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 a research project that was done in, 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 um, in London in, uh, the, between the LSE and, and, a, and a kind of civil society project called Who Targets Me, uh, which crowdsourced uh, political ads sent through Facebook essentially asked people to collect, download a, a browser plugin um, which would uh, automatically collect the uh, um, political ads that were sent to them uh, and then aggregate those and then the LSE, uh, a group of the LSE was researching them and understanding whether those ads were contradictory, whether those ads were kind of positive, destructive, negative, etc. Um, and trying to actually do some, um, uh, expose some of the uh, the problems of that, that political communication, but also uh, try to get rid of some of the scare, scare stories around um, what people are actually communicating online uh, and whether or not um, we are actually being manipulated. Uh, and the third one is um, to look at the, the kind of methods and, and narratives of um, particularly malicious actors when they are trying to, to seed and spread disinformation. Um, project we're doing at the moment, uh, which is supported by uh, the Open Society Foundation, is looking at how um, uh, Russian propaganda is seeded uh, uh, within, or, or, or how it travels into mainstream media and, and, and how it, how it um, spreads uh, beyond mainstream media. And particularly looking at some of the patterns and some of the uh, specific narratives used to try and get it into mainstream media and, and why, why it goes and what, what gets sustained and what doesn't. Um, now, I think each of those research projects in itself um, uh, I think would be, both, would be helpful from an understanding perspective, but then from a very practical perspective as well, because I think you can, in the first case, I think you can actually change the dynamics of the way sites are structured, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Facebook, whatever site it is, such that they are uh, less, less toxic, they are less damaging. Um, in the second uh, place, I think you can expose some of the um, uh, conspiracy theories around political campaigns that currently exist. And in the third case, I think we can uh, uh, really better understand the ways in which it's not just Russia, but the ways in which um, uh, hostile states and other actors are trying to seed misinformation into different national uh, uh, media, uh, how they're doing it, and try to uh, prevent it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, all three panelists, all of you have been incredibly uh, constructive and concrete in terms of looking at solutions here. But since this is a, a, a panel, a, a session about critical perspectives on the disinformation discussion, I just want to start by asking you the question that none of you uh, addressed, which is, is there a problem here? How big is there a problem? And is this a problem that actually um, should be uh, um, absorbing as much political attention as it currently is? So let me just start with um, Alexios, then with Farida, and then with Martin. Because there's a debate about whether we're looking at a really genuinely new phenomenon and something that's worse than we've ever seen before, or whether we're looking at a manifestation of an increasingly polarized political environment 
of which much of the disinformation discussion that we're having is a manifestation of that rather than something that's changed more radically either in technology or delivery systems or whatever. So I just want to ask each of you to respond to that big question relatively briefly before I open up to discussions. Alexios. Yes. Yes, that's very <laughs> uh, Yes, there is a problem uh, in the sense that uh, our uh, major channels of uh, online information distribution uh, are hardwired in such a way that it was way too easy uh, to reach, to, to bring something very old, this information, uh, to a whole new scale. Um, and, and that, to me, seems like a technical problem to which we would need to sort of start pulling out a bunch of technical solutions. The, and that's, in our small, that's what the, the, the fact-checking partnership is trying to do. What has happened is then we've injected into this technical solution a bunch of political problems, a bunch of moral issues, a bunch of business model issues, uh, hate speech, uh, and by doing so, we've made it intractable. So I think we need to talk about the political problem in one bucket, we need to talk about data privacy in another bucket, we need to deal with hate speech at another time, and we need to deal with the fact that misinformation, you know, that fake shark photo shouldn't be reaching millions of people every single uh, uh, bloody time. So I think that's, there's a problem. Uh, we've made it into this uh, toxic cauldron of things that just people then are like, oh my God, we can't do anything, let's yeah. walk away. Okay, that's very helpful. Farida, do you wanna, is there a problem? Um, yes. Uh, if I could sh show the image. Sure. So in this, um, how many of you have seen this image? Oh, you say everybody, not everybody's hands going up. So <laughs> 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 That's interesting. <laughs> okay, so a lot of people, I guess, have seen it. I'd say there's not, not everybody in this room. I'd say no. there's about 5% of people in this room. Okay. okay, so just a very brief explainer. This image um, arose out of the Westminster attacks last year in March in London. Uh, the perpetrator of the attacks was a Muslim, a, a recently converted Muslim, um, and this image started circulating on social media, and what it shows is uh, someone, um, uh, one of the victims on the Westminster Bridge, and prominently showing a Muslim woman who appears to be not interested in looking at the victim. So she, the, the interpretation that is, um, is being given in this tweet um, by Texas Lone Star here is essentially that this woman um, you know, doesn't care about the victims, you know, carelessly um, is on her phone and, and just walks past. And then a series of, um, of hashtags that, that give this a particular flavor. So why am I showing you this? Um, because I think this image really shows the kind of the complexity of what we're dealing with um, in, you know, in this moment. Um, this is an image that, of course, triggers lots of emotions, um, not just in the UK, but in Europe. Um, so any image that kind of can, can get to the core of religious tension, um, you know, homophobia, Islamophobia, and so on, um, you know, obviously um, finds fertile ground um, in, different, in different national contexts. Um, what is very significant about this image is that um, the user purports to be American and essentially a sort of alt-right kind of um, user. Um, and this then uh, went viral. It got a lot of attention. It was covered very, very widely in the UK uh, mainstream media. Um, There's a lot of tabloid coverage. Uh, the woman was um, shamed. Um, she, they, they found her. She had to explain that she was, you know, um, going to um, to get her kids from school. So she, you know, she was in a hurry and so on. So there was a ton of media attention around it. There were big Twitter discussions um, on this as well. Um, and this user seemed to be one of the key nodes in terms of pushing this out. So this is all happening in March. Um, there's around 80 articles that were spent in the mainstream media on this, on this controversy. It is only with the congressional hearings in the US in November when Twitter is forced to release a list of known um, Russian agents operating on the platform that this user was revealed to be um, a Russian agent, right? So in terms of temporality, what we're dealing with is so many months after the fact, so many months after the image has done so much damage and is still, of course, searchable, and, and when you search uh, in, on Google Westminster attack Muslim, um, this is the image that shows up. 
even though it's been debunked, right? So I think this, to me, is such a um, compelling example of the issue that we're dealing with, that the traces of this disinformation, and here we're dealing with disinformation that is purposefully um, being seeded to undermine democratic processes, um, and, and lives on algorithmically in, in different ways. Um, I think, yes, we are, we are dealing with a significant problem. Thank you. Martin? Um, I, th I think I, I upset a bunch of people last year, about a year ago or so, when I said that, um, that fake news was, was a red herring. I mean, in, in the sense that I think fake news um, as an idea uh, is, is, is a simply a symptom of a much, much bigger problem, um, digital problem, the whole digital environment. And um, as we've seen, it's been uh, phenomenally politicized um, and used by um, many people for their own purposes. Um, and there is, a, I think the problem, there is a problem, the problem is much bigger, I think, to go slightly against what Alexios just said. Um, I think the problem at the moment is by trying to think of it as a, as a single issue or trying to focus on, on an issue, which is, a, which is either, call it fake news, call it misinformation, disinformation, um, that suggests that there are um, sort of uh, very specific responses that you can make which are going to resolve this. That's, that's just, I think, a uh, fallacy. I think, that, that's, um, uh, I think what we have to start to recognize is that the digital environment um, is, is a mess in, 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 in a lot of respects, and particularly in terms of the way in which it's, it's, um, uh, it works economically. Um, and, and in that sense, I think rather than, I mean, we do have to see them as separate issues, but we have to see it as a much, much broader structural issue. We have to see it holistically, rather than trying to say, okay, how do we deal with fake news? And, and can we create an authority? Can we create a regulator? Can we create a monitoring service or a police force that can deal with fake news or misinformation? Because, because that's not going to work. That's not gonna work at all. I mean, I think things like fact-checking um, organizations are incredibly useful. Um, but they will always necessarily be a band-aid on a much, you know, a huge and expanding issue. Um, a very useful and necessary band-aid, but still a band-aid. And until we recognize the bigger structural problems, um, then, then the issue will continue to grow. Um, Just so I'm clear, when you say the bigger structural problems in a sentence, what do you mean? I mean that the incentives for producing fake news, whether they're economic or political, are, um, are such that it's, 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 it makes sense to produce advertising that is um, more clickable, whether it's true, whether it's false. It's cheaper for the Trump campaign to send out ads via Facebook um, that are highly engaging and, and highly um, provocative than it is for, um, to send out very measured um, uh, sort of centrist messages via the same platform. Similarly with Internet Research Agency, it's much cheaper for them to send stuff out. Um, the, more, the more provocative it is, the more clickable it is, the higher it rates in terms of um, engagement, in terms of the, um, the uh, ad system on Facebook and on Google, and so therefore the cheaper it is for them to send. So, you know, that's what I mean in terms of the structures. The, the, the structures are set up in such a way that it actually um, uh, benefits people to produce um, misinformation and disinformation and to hyperpartisan news, etc., cetera, um, rather than the opposite. Okay. Um, I suspect Alexios may want to come back on some of what you said, but I'm gonna go to you, the audience, first and get a sense of who wants to come in on this discussion now. And um, uh, okay, just wait for us to get a microphone to you right in the front here. And then after that, we'll go to the gentleman in the third row over here. But there's a microphone just coming to you just uh, about now. Thank you. Hi, um, I'd like to get uh, the thoughts from the panelists on the subject of digital literacy and personal responsibility and corporate responsibility towards ensuring that there is a more literate audience. Because it seems like that's the one thing that hasn't come up here. Um, obviously, there is a problem, but there's also an element of personal responsibility that educators, parents, uh, users need to take in order to understand if the information that they're receiving is uh, misinformed or is disinformation. Okay, thank you. Um, uh I'm, um, I'm going to, who wants to deal with the question of digital literacy? I don't think this is a panel where everybody has to respond to every point. So who would really like to do that? Farida, you'd like to come in on that? And Martin, okay. okay. Um, yeah, I mean, this is obviously connected. Um, so one of the things that I think is important to understand about digital literacy and um, kind of critical skills 
is I feel that there's always an assumption that whilst I agree that it is part of a suite of solutions to consider, it, it, it almost always assumes that users and citizens want these skills and want to um, have critical thinking skills in order to um, you know, like deal with image, like the image that I, that I showed. Um, and Ofcom produced a, an interesting report, I think it was last year, um, they do an annual, an annual report looking at um, um, uh, new attitudes uh, to news and on, uh, online and news attitudes. Um, and one of the things that they highlighted is that when people uh, connect with a piece of online news, 20% of um, people surveyed never check any other source in relation to that piece of content. That is really high. So one in five people basically have no desire whatsoever to, to verify or check, even if that is potentially available. Right? And so I think we're, we also have to um, understand that that is an uphill struggle in terms of people's desire, users' desire, citizens' desire to actually have these skills. Um, and I think one in five is quite high in terms of people just not having any interest in this whatsoever. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, that these efforts shouldn't be made, um, but I think um, they should probably be made from a much earlier age than is currently happening. So, I mean, I have a, an eight-month-old daughter now, and I'm already thinking, you know, what is, what is her, you know, online life going to be from, you know, maybe from age five. I mean, I'm really shocked that from about three months old, she's just like, the phone, the phone, the phone, and trying to swipe. I mean, you know, what is going on there? So I think in terms of digital literacy skills, um, I think we need to start much, much earlier, and it, and it needs to be something that is a kind of seen really as a life skill that isn't just a sort of, you know, you go on this course and, and therefore, you know, you have a set of skills, but it's something that, you know, just, just is, is throughout, you know, kind of your life, basically. Okay, thank you. Martin? Just quickly, I, I, I experienced, um, Frida was talking about firsthand, in a way, before I joined King's, I ran a little NGO for about 10 years, which um, one of the things we did was we developed quite a lot of tools to help people navigate the news, particularly to try and navigate between credible and less credible news. Um, and some of that was about um, giving people the tools to see uh, who the journalist was and where they came from and, you know, what kind of therefore trying to understand their motivations and where they, what they wrote about. Others were, um, there was a site called Journalism, which was, we, we automatically compared press releases with news articles and showed people the kind of percentage cut and paste that there was in news articles, et cetera. Um, and there was always a core audience who really cared about that sort of stuff and used it and found it very useful. Um, many of them often journalists or connected to journalism. Um, but the vast majority of people really, really didn't. I mean, even when we tried to kind of pro you know, proactively go out and engage them and everything else, unless it was a, sp a very specific direct relevance to them. Unless, unless, for example, you know, it was a story about multiple vaccinations and they were thinking about whether or not to give their child a multiple vaccination, then they would really care about the sourcing of the story, they care about the credibility of the story. In most cases, it's really hard. Um, now, having said that, I mean, I think, you know, to come to the greatest point, I mean, I, I do have, and I, you know, I teach um, uh, uh, master's students and others, I do have uh, hope for the next generation. I think, I think there is a huge generational divide. I mean, I've talked about the Senate, et cetera, but I think, you know, um, if you talked to an awful lot of 20-somethings, um, the conversation would have been entirely different. I mean, you know, quite a lot of my master's students know a lot more than me about the mechanics of the internet and how it works. Um, so I think, I think we are seeing this huge transition um, and we're going, through, um, we're going through the difficult bit. We're going through the, the bit where there's an awful lot of people who are expected to make policy about this, about this area and don't really get it, and a lot of people who are using this area um, in, in an era where there aren't really any policies. Um, so I think we'll, we will get through it. But that's where we end up. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to this gentleman here. Yeah, just uh, there. Thank you. Good evening. I have a question for Farida Vis. Um, in the case of um, the Westminster attack photo, in fact, uh, The Guardian perhaps had a, quite a good solution against mm, the, that piece of, of, of uh, propaganda. He put the photo that was made two seconds after when the, the woman was looking at the, at the photographer and it was clear that he was in, in real pain. He was afraid, he, she was afraid. It was clear to every human being that could, 
uh, see the other photo. And the, the Guardian put the, the, the two photos, one uh, close to the other, and it was clear that the framing was false. It was clear, it was to, uh, so in perhaps, uh, but on Google, on Google photo, there is no the, fo the other photo, the second that it was taken perhaps one second after that. So perhaps uh, Google or the, um, or Yahoo could, could um, uh, when one photo became a signal of propaganda, is used for propaganda as a propaganda piece, could uh, give uh, some um, place to other photo that, um, that uh, are true, like, like this photo, because it's true, it's not modified. But that could put the, the, the propaganda piece in, an, in a more realistic frame. It, is it possible that uh, um, uh, when the, the, a, a real photo is, is used as propaganda piece, other real photo could be used to, this in Ascari, come si dice? To unmask the, the propaganda. Thank you. Um, I mean, there's obviously nothing new about a series of images being available of an event and um, editors making a decision about showing a, a particular image, right? So to show a particular moment in the sequence of images. And that, that also happens with, with videos. Um, I did work many, many years ago at the start of the Second Intifada, and there's a, an image, there was a video of Mohammed al Dura. I don't know if, if anybody remembers this, of a, a Palestinian boy dying in his, in his father's arms. And that was a video, and the, the still that, that basically went around the world is of him, you know, kind of Pieta-like in his, in his father's arms. And um, we did a report a few years ago around the refugee crisis, around the image of Alan Kurdi. Um, and there were a number of images. There was an image of him on the, alone. There was an image of um, the two Turkish police officers looking at the body. There was an image of the, the police officer picking up, um, picking up the child. So there is nothing new about multiple images being available for the same event. Um, I think what you're talking about is more a agreed strategy when there is this kind of disagreement, if it's known to try and publish, you know, alongside each other, a number of images. Um, and in this case, you, get, you give the example of The Guardian, but this is certainly not what, what happened, you know, um, in, in other newspapers. And so if you look on Google, you see the different um, moments, essentially, in the sequence of events of this woman walking past and different newspapers making different choices in terms of, in terms of the framing. Um, but in terms of, I think you described this as, as a false framing, there's nothing false about the framing, it's just the framing. Because the image itself is not tempered. So, so if you look at the sequences of how this woman looks, there is a moment where she looks like that, and that's clearly, that, that moment lends itself to a particular kind of interpretation, but that isn't that's false. Yeah. 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 more realistic, more, yeah. more um, less, um, it, it is not propaganda a piece, while there are sh the, the, um, the other framing is, yeah. uh, is not co co coherent with the um, mental state of the woman, in, I can say. Yeah, so, the, so there's a, it's, a call, it's a kind of a call for um, allowing viewers more options to make up their minds. But this, but this question connects to the last question about both about literacy and also motivation, where, mm -hmm. um, where both Martin and Farida responded that um, it's both a question about giving people the tools to be able to have several different readings of a situation, but above and beyond that, there's a question that came up before about people's motivation to pursue that. Um, I'm going to move on um, because I think we've got the point there, uh, but thank you. I'll take the lady in the back and uh, right in the last row there, and then I come to the gentleman in the front row here. Um, yeah. Thank you. I'm Indira Lakshmanan from the Pointer Institute, and I really like the point that Alexios made about the different buckets of problems. And Alexios, since you only just passingly mentioned the different buckets, I'd like you to elaborate on how you see us dealing with all of those problems, because they're all real problems, 
I don't want to say interconnected, but related in some way. And so in the misinformation space, how do you deal with that? How do you see us dealing with all those different categories that you mentioned? Okay. Uh, that's very clear, and it's addressed to... And I swear we didn't plant that. No, I was going to say, I, I don't know whether there should be some full disclosure that's about right. this, but you did say where you were from. Yeah, so, yeah, she okay. was. <laughs> um, th the reality is uh, this bucketization of mine comes from a frustration uh, that I have no idea how to deal with most of the buckets. Um, that I have a, a good sense, though, of how to deal with viral misinformation that shouldn't be reaching uh, as large an audience. And so um, polarization, honestly, I put my hands up. I don't know. Um, hate speech, there are laws in most countries that outlaw it and that can very easily be translated from what is true of what you can and can't say on the press uh, to, to what is true of what you can and can't do on, on social media. I really do think that what's happened with sort of data, you know, the data breaches, you know, in, impose the very hefty fines on this type of stuff, have, uh, have an independent data authority. I really do think that we're, uh, just to also, I guess, answer uh, uh, Martin's challenge, was that until and unless, yes, there are structural issues, uh, central of which the fact that on Facebook, the, the central monetizable moment instance is an emotional one, right? The like, the share, the comment, whatever else. Uh, that's a big structural issue. But we could spend the next 15 years talking about structural issues, and, they, and we should, but we're... <laughs> There are fake photos uh, uh, um, that are reaching millions now, and I'd just like them to reach hundreds of thousands of people. And that's uh, something, maybe if we get a, a few easy wins now to get us moving, uh, then we can, other people smarter than I can deal with the, the other problems. Sorry, I didn't actually answer your question, Indira, as evidence of the fact that she gave me a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. thank you. Um, yes, to you, sir. getting benefits from the misinformation and all these things. So my question is, are those actors more powerful than the tech-savvy companies, including Google or Facebook or the other institutions, Wall Street Journal or the organizations who are dealing with the fact-checking and the fake news? And the second question is like, uh, you know, once one thing is being uploaded on the internet and it goes and goes and goes in different rooms. And I read about the flames on fire, it was just like a small video or a short video from the ISIS and they uploaded on YouTube and the US government asked them to delete it and they claimed, the YouTube claimed that they deleted it 4,000 times, but it's still on the YouTube. You can watch it, a trailer or something. So is it possible to remove all those misinformed or this type of content completely 100% from the internet or all those channels including like from all the governments or the institutions or the people who are dealing with this phenomenon? No. <laughs> I mean, so, so, so do you, you, your first question was about whether they're more powerful. Um, I, think that, I think there's a misunderstanding about power at the moment. I think that what we're seeing is we're seeing shifts in power. Um, people keep talking about people being empowered, power going to here, power going to there. I don't think, I think that's, that's, I mean, clearly, uh, some people are gaining and some people are losing, but I think it's more the fact that it's shifting and that makes, and when, when power shifts, it makes people feel very unstable and very uh, worried. Um, but I think rather than, than necessarily, they are being empowered by these tools, but it's partly because these platforms have deliberately created, are de deliberately created in such a way as to be as open and frictionless as possible. Um, now you can't, so you can't serve 2.2 billion people, as Facebook does on a daily basis, um, individualized pages, and have any sort of human monitoring of those pages. It's, it's impossible. Clearly, it's impossible. Um, and in terms of for advertising, for example, um, you know, why can the Internet Research Agency buy ads on Facebook and serve them to very specific audiences in the U.S. because it's self-service? You know, they go on, they choose which currency they're going to pay in. Um, they decide who they're going to aim it at. They do it all themselves. Anyone in this room can do that. Um, it, so it's, they're being empowered by the tools, and they are um, I sp you know, claiming that they are kind of adhering to, to the terms of service. And of course, when it comes to political, and this is where I think you know, we haven't really talked too much about this here, although we've talked mostly about political stuff, but 
it's, it, it really genuinely is much, much harder to deal with than lots of other, uh, whether it's taste and decency, whether it's commercial or copyright issues, etc. Uh, there's no surpri surprise in a way that in the UK, someone like the Advertising Standards Association, which regulates advertising, does not regulate political advertising because they say it's, it, you know, it, it becomes a judgment call. You know, we saw what happened with Facebook and, and uh, it's... Um, New, trending news in the Republican Party. And we still saw that on Tuesday with the Republicans saying, you know, do you discriminate against right-wing news? Because we, when it comes to, I mean, in a way, this is a whole category of misinformation, hyper-partisan information, which is, is by far, I think, the most difficult to deal with um, uh, because you're making necessarily very subjective judgments. But um, Martin, Martin, when you said you can't stop these things, I mean, um, you can, sorry, sorry, no, but, but, I but you can. I mean, anybody who's been to China recently to your second will, question. will know that in, a, yeah. in some environments, but there's obviously a price. Well, exactly. So to your second question, I think, I think the problem we have now, and the reason why now is a very dangerous moment, is actually if we shift from a completely open, if you like, relatively ungoverned system to a hygienic system. Um, and Facebook has, has said, we're going to make the site more hygienic, we're going to work with government to try and work out. Make it. And, and we know that they can uh, intervene significantly. And we don't have any, any research on this as yet, but I have a German student uh, who says that he saw a visible difference between his newsfeed in Germany and his newsfeed in the UK when the new, the new German net law went through. Um, and it's, it, it is, these companies are now being incentivized to be as conservative and censorious as possible, because otherwise they're liable to significant fines. Uh, and that could be an even more dangerous world than the one we created previously. Um, thank you. I'm just going to move us on. I'm just going to ask uh, the panelists, or indeed anybody in the audience, I mean, uh, fact-checking is one element of what we're talking about, but much fact-checking is underwritten by um, uh, one or other of the main tech companies at the moment. Um, and I just wondered whether anybody on the platform initially, what, what you feel about that? Is that really good? Because that's a good way of uh, introducing um, some uh, more good actors into a difficult space? Or do you feel it's compromising in some way? I mean, uh, I think I'd ask back uh, what you mean uh, by them underwriting much of it. I think that... Uh, um, Funding? Yeah, no, but I, I would challenge that that is... Uh, I mean, for sure, Facebook is... a pumping a lot of money through its third-party fact-checking product, and, uh, and that's a big story. Uh, but for instance, in the United States, uh, Snopes is largely ad uh, revenue funded. Um, the Post and the, uh, obviously the Post pays for the, the fact-checking project there. Uh, I th think the major problem is that there isn't any money in fact-checking, <laughs> more than that there is too much money from, from the platforms. And actually, when it comes to Facebook uh, underwriting, uh, uh, the way that partnership is actually, Facebook is paying for a service that is expensive, for a journalistic service. That should be a model for other journalists. When I see, and this conference has been full of it, people saying we need an endowment from Facebook and Google and, and we look pretty pathetic because we're supplicants to these big giants. We need to put value to the work that we do as journalists and make them pay for it. And that's what the fact-checking product is about. The moment that it's not a service that Facebook wants to pay for, we'll, sell, we'll offer this service to someone else or we'll find other ways to pay for it. Uh, but that concerns me much less than, yes, than Google and Facebook putting millions and hundreds of millions in, 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 in projects and fellowships and things that uh, uh, we sort of jump through hoops to get uh, but actually aren't part of our mission. Okay. Uh, other people on the platform? Martin, do you want to come in on this? It does strike me as, as slightly ironic. That, um, you know, as I said, the, these platforms that, that in many ways incentivize quite a lot of this disinformation then spend uh, a very small proportion of their money on fact-checking organizations, which, as I say, are extremely useful but are only ever going to solve a very small proportion of the problem. Um, uh, it also seems to me, and I would worry about this if I was in a fact-checking organization, that they're to a certain extent, not deliberately, but to a certain extent being set up for a fall. Um, because For a fall? Yeah, yeah. because um, I, th I think the problem is so significant, it is so uh, 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 difficult and complex, um, that I think that, that, and particularly because of, as Alexio said, the limits with which Facebook, the limited information with which Facebook is, is giving them, um, that actually, uh, as the problem expands and persists, um, it will be very difficult for the fact-taking organizations to claim that they've been successful. Um, and actually, they could end up being lightning rods 
um, for some of the criticism uh, in the future, uh, and that, that worries me. Did you want to comment on this, Farida, or not? Just briefly, yeah. and then I'm going to take another question from there. So I guess one of the things that does worry me slightly as an academic is um, how to think critically about your role in potentially improving the product for one of these companies through the research that you do, right? So I have reasons for doing this, right? And I think my reasons are genuine and good and wholesome and whatever, but I struggle with the thought that some of that research is then directly used to improve um, Facebook, for example, and you know, for, for a platform to make further money. Um, so I think when it comes to academics working very closely with these platforms, um, particularly in this space, I think it's also important to have these discussions, to think about, you know, what are you actually doing? And you might, might be doing it for, you know, reasons that are really, really clear to you in your mind, um, but to just kind of say these things openly and, and you know, and, and, and think about this collectively, what does that mean for what is potentially then um, possible on, on these platforms? And it is something that, that I, I worry about. Um, okay, thank you. I'm gonna take a question from the gentleman there. Yeah. I just wanted to just respond to um, your comment about setting the fact checkers up for a fall. So I'm Bill Adair, I'm the creator of PolitiFact and now teach at Duke and sort of full disclosure, have gotten grants from Facebook and, and Google for some of the products we've developed. Um, I, you know, I think, I'm not necessarily sure I agree that it's setting them up for a fall because I think the key for the fact checkers, one, as Alexio said, the the fact checkers are, are being compensated for work that is expensive and that is helping Facebook, um, Facebook's product. And, and I feel like um, the, the success or failure isn't in necessarily um, the, you know, if, if it's not as effective that's okay because we're all still learning about this. And so if the data, when the data is finally released, um, if the data shows, well, it hasn't been as effective, then let's tweak how we present it. And so one of the things I think Facebook's been willing to do is change how it presents it. Um, so I'm not sure, do you want to elaborate on sort of what you mean setting them up for a fall? To what, to what extent, I guess, does it disguise the larger problem? To what extent does it make it seem as though, okay, we have a problem here. The problem is misinformation and false information on Facebook. We can deal with it by supporting a bunch of these most relatively, most of them relatively small organizations going through and identifying false information and flagging it. Uh, to what extent does that disguise what's actually the much bigger problem, which is that actually Facebook by its economic model is essentially incentivizing people to produce a lot of this information in the first place and produce much more of it than you can ever deal with. So, and, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of, I suppose, lipstick on a pig. I'm yeah. gonna, I, but I think, um, and this is where I share Alexios's desire to get full transparency of what Facebook has done and see what the impact <laughs> is because it, it may, it, it may show that there is not that incentive anymore because of the third party fact checking. Okay, I'm gonna draw a line under that and let the two of you <laughs> continue that conversation outside in a minute. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask a final question to each of our three panelists here. Um, I'm gonna give them a choice of two questions, but basically the last week or 10 days in common with much of the last sort of few years has seen a lot of the discussion in this space largely happening in the US, recent, most recently focused on Zuckerberg's appearance uh, in, in Congress. So my question, you can choose one of these, you don't have to answer both of them, and I'd like a brief answer from each of you. Um, you can choose between these two questions. If, if Mark Zuckerberg was going to the European Parliament, what's the one question he should be asked that he wasn't asked by Congress? Or, if Europe was to do one thing about the phenomenon we've been talking about this afternoon, what would you like to see um, some European institution do? So you can take your pick, the question to put to Zuckerberg from the European Parliament, or one thing that you would like to see the European Union do in this space. Um, who wants to go first? This, um, uh, I can't see any volunteers yet, but um, it will be over soon. Uh, <laughs> who wants to have a first go? I think, Alexios, would you mind going? Since you've sat on the European high-level group, you're probably ought to be best place to decide which of 
what you think would be the right answer to one of these two. I mean, since we, uh, you've been so kind to sit with us for, for an hour and a quarter, I will spare you the boring six lines that I mentioned at the top of like a more systemic thing and say, actually go for the, the cheeky answer, which is if the EU were to do one thing about it, it would be to keep itself out of it. When the EU enters with its East Ratcom disinformation review that targets uh, Russian disinformation and politicizes fact-checking on a Russia versus EU uh, line, it makes the work for actual fact-checkers a lot harder and it risks polarizing fact-checking in Europe in the same way that it's polarized in the United States. Thank you very much. Who wants to go next? Farida? Or um, I guess, the wow, well, I'm just, they're both very <laughs> tough, kind of pulling and pu pushing it away. Um, they're, yeah, they're, they're tough questions. I guess in terms of the EU, I think um, to not go in too heavy-handed and to not provide a blueprint that will then be adopted internationally that then um, takes us to a place where discussion amongst key players becomes much, much harder. And I think at the moment, um, we need much more discussion and we need much more collaboration. And I think if you go in too heavy handed, all the calls for accountability and transparency, um, you're shutting that down. Thank you. Martin. Uh, I think I'll go very left field and say, um, I would encourage Margrethe Vesteyer to, to keep going um, with antitrust. The Competition Commission. Yes. Yes. To keep going. Absolutely. Okay, so we have two members of our panel who, in response to the invitation to give critical perspectives on the disinformation discussion, say, do less, <laughs> and one who says, do more, but about something a bit broader than disinformation. So um, please join me in thanking Alexios, Farida, and Martin. Thank you.